Hi, Dave Levine here. Thanks for joining me for episode number 10 of the Sports Stories podcast. So far, we've had a fantastic range of guests, including international coach developers, heads of coaching, coaches, senior leaders, and Olympians. Well, today we have another incredible story from our special guest, Sarah Symington. Sarah is both a senior leader and a former Olympian. I'm so looking forward to speaking with her. I know she'll be really honest about her experiences and will provide insights into the world of performance sport from both a performance athlete perspective and a senior leader and performance director perspective. I'm also keen to hear what learning she has taken from sport into her roles in business and conversely, what she has taken from business into sport. So it gives me enormous amounts of pleasure to welcome my special guest for today, Sarah Symington. Sarah, it's really, really great to have you with me today. Thanks for giving up your time. I uh, appreciate that it's a very busy time of year, given the circumstances around the coronavirus and lockdown. And I know from our previous conversations, you've got a huge amount going on. So I I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. I'm really excited about talking with you today on the Sports Stories podcast, because the times that I've got to know you and hearing little elements about your story in terms of your cycling career, you know, being at the Olympics and Commonwealth Games and so on. Also, your work in the business world and in the police and now having come back into sport just is an amazing career. Um, And so hopefully today we can give our listeners a little bit more of an insight into your story. But also what I'd love to to try and give them is, uh, uh, as well as that insight, is some tips and some guidance as to how they can be inspired by your journey. So I'd like to start us off really with, can you share a little bit about your first experience of sport, your introduction to it, and then we'll, we'll move into actually your journey through. So your first introduction to sport. Yeah. Um, well, where do I start? Uh, I suppose I was that kid that played every sport possible all the way through my school. Um, you know, it ranged from squash to hockey to swimming to cross country to athletics to windsurfing to sailing. Uh, you know, you, karate, you name it. Uh, I wanted to give it a go, if I'm honest with you. So that, that it was so important to me and I just loved and craved every every um, opportunity there was. Um, and so that kind of really, really did drive uh, what I did next. And I kind of went to Warwick University and I, st- I wanted to be a teacher, if I'm honest with you. Um, well, that's what I thought at the time. And I went to Warwick University uh, and started a teaching degree. But after a year, I, I changed my mind. And there is a bit of a, um, a theme that's probably going to be here in terms of some of my journey to date is I, I'm, I'm someone to try things, but if it's not quite right for me, I will change <laughs> Basically, or I'll make the decision to change. So I I ended up going to Loughborough University. I know again, sports science. Uh, a lot of people have tread this path. Um, great three years. I mean, you know, every university um, journey is is a great great experience. Basically, and my two sports at that point were predominantly squash and hockey. Um, and a bit of running as well, actually. So after well, when I when I finished my degree. I was like, what next? Um, And I'd started to venture into the sport of triathlon at that point. Um, And to be fair, I ended up going into the police. Um, And you could say, why the police? (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, Again, I had a few friends who were doing it. And at the time, sports science probably wasn't as established as it is now. You either went down the research route or you went and worked in the gym, if I'm being brutally honest. But I kind of thought I quite liked to go and try the police because it sounded exciting there was variety in it and again that's probably something that I've always um, searched for in in what I do on a professional level is the variety of what a role you know where it takes me but also where it stretches me as well so for the three years I I was a police officer and that was a great experience and if I'm honest with you yeah, it's 25 years since I was doing that role, but it taught me so much that I've taken through my career, you know, whether it was dealing with life and death situations, not that I've had to deal with any in the sport world, um, dealing with conflict, dealing uh, with, you know, people that need pacifying negotiation skills, uh, resolving emotional disputes, um, to the compliance factor, to write, writing up reports, to, you know, um, finding out data and working with legal to interviewing people. So to be fair, that whole experience of three years has really, really stood me um, instead. Um, At the same time, I was, as I said, I was venturing into triathlon and I got onto the cusp of the Great Britain triathlon squad at that point. Um, 
uh, and I was coaching myself. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why not? Um, why not? Uh, at, the, at that point, I didn't know myself well enough. And um, I, I was trying to work full time, do chef work, plus coach myself in something that I, I didn't know enough about. And I ended up with chronic fatigue. Uh, that's the short story um, and, and it took me about two years to almost get to the point where I knew what it was and I would kind of traipsed around different doctors GPs consultants because I, I genuinely did not know what's going on wrong, on wrong with me I, I'd train and then I'd kind of like literally be absolutely fatigued for two three you know weeks at a time and it got to the point where I was so tired I had to quit training basically so it was through Richard Budget someone uh, Rod Jakes who's the CMO of EIS now he referred me on to Richard Budget who was the doctor of British rowing at the time yeah. um, and it was the first person that almost helped helped kind of put a label to it as to what I was experiencing and it was a form of overtraining syndrome slash chronic fatigue whatever you wanted to call it um, and at that point, I was then starting to explore what I wanted to do next. I'd really loved my three years in the police, but I couldn't see myself continuing it long term. Yeah. So some might say this was a cheat option, uh, but I went back to a university um, and did a master's in sports science. I mean, I had explored other career opportunities, uh, but I also recognized I wanted to probably go back towards sport. And to stand out, I, at the time, I felt I needed to go down the master's route. So I'd saved enough money, um, put myself back through a master's. I did a bit of part-time work, lecturing at Loughborough um, and also teaching self-defence for the police. Yeah. So, yeah, just trying to keep, you know, money coming in to pay for X, Y and Z. Um, but at that year, I didn't do any exercise whatsoever because I was still coming through uh, chronic fatigue. Yeah. Um, Rod Jakes, who's the head CMO of EIS, he very kindly helped me come back or guided me as to how I got back into exercise. Um, and by then, the world of triathlon or the sport of triathlon had moved on. It'd become a foot race. Um, and whilst I could run, I wasn't going to run 32, 33 minutes for a 10K. I was down to about 36, 37 minutes. And that's where the sport was going. So cycling had always been my strongest discipline. Um, and the guy that I was living with at the time, still a really good friend, he said, why don't you have a go at road racing? And it, it, you know, uh, and that's how it happened. It happened by mistake. I, well, not mistake. Uh, I entered a few races in this country. I won one. I got uh, second in another. Um, and I basically got talent spotted, for want of a better word. And, and it, it was it was that my break into professional sport. I'd always, always envisioned going to the Olympics. I had this childhood dream. How or when or what sport, who knows. But uh, essentially, this is where it started. Um, and that was the start of my journey. At that point, I was writing up my dissertation. Uh, I was looking at other job opportunities. I had my dad in my ear, go and get yourself a proper job because he could see me getting sucked into right. this, this, this cycling piece. Um, but I was very fortunate. Uh, I was selected, uh, well, I got this phone call out the blue, selected for the Commonwealth Games in 1998 in Kuala Lumpur. I can still recall that moment in time. Uh, I had to get the person that told me to repeat the message two or three times because I was like, what? What does that feel like, Sarah, when you get that call for, for such, an, uh, such an amazing event which you've been working towards or aspiring for? Uh, it, 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 it didn't feel real. I mean, it, it literally, I hadn't come through a pathway. Um, I hadn't I cycled professionally, I hadn't cycled uh, competitively. So really, I, I was 28, 28 years old as well. So, <laughs> you know, uh, there was that factor as well. Um, and one thing I, I think, it, yeah, it just felt unreal. But, you know, uh, again, I just grabbed the opportunity. And this is, again, something that I always come back to in terms of looking in my past career is about grabbing opportunities and see where it leads to. Whilst I only had £250 in my bank account and there was no promise of money whatsoever, uh, of which didn't come on board and for another six months um, through, you know, British Cycling basically testing me to see whether they were going to pick me up and I was of, uh, of the right ability and trajectory to be able to establish, you know, medal success or podium success. So I kind of went with it and borrow, begged and borrowed some money. Um, uh, went to the 
Commonwealth Games, I crashed. Uh, and I'll be brutally honest with you, I didn't have, I had the power, but I didn't have the skill set. Uh, and the library of experiences about how you want to road race at that point in time. And I think, again, uh, it was about learning fast, um, about how I translated that, but learned from the experiences that I went through as a cyclist to be able to, you know, accelerate my learning, but also execute wins or execute podium finishes mm. through through those experiences. So I was on a fast track approach, I'd say. How did you learn fast? What did you put in place to accelerate that, given that's what you needed to do? Um, I, I was really fortunate. Um, uh, there was a couple of uh, riders that were, were, were experienced, and they were very, very... Um, Yvonne McGregor, she went on to medal at Sydney um, Olympic Games, of which, you know, that, that was one of my biggest achievements if I'm honest with you I, I got selected for those games within 18 months of kind of entering the world of cycling so she was very very uh, passionate and very open with some of her her knowledge basically and learnings uh, which someone I'm someone I'm, I'm still in contact with her that's you know there was a real connection there then our current then our team manager at the time a guy a guy again a guy called John Herity who had raced professionally um he was a real uh i suppose real great mentor for me and i used to pick his brains basically uh continuously about what he learned but also just you know the road craft and the 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 ability to read races and what to do at certain points so and then you know yourself you have to kind of soak up everything that's happening at happening in front of you but also there was a big aspect of getting to know who you were but also getting to know how your body reacted to the training and having gone through that chronic fatigue experience in yeah. some ways accelerated it because i had made some really bad mistakes uh, in terms of uh, that triathlon piece and i re- that that taught me a lot about my, me and my body and how it reacts to certain elements of training so uh, I went into a, a sort of program that it was very much about big, big blocks of volume of which I experimented with, but I also recognized at certain points, my physiology and my immune system could not soak up that amount of volume. And we had to become quite creative around the training program that I followed. But also I had to be quite brave at times to turn around to coaches at that point and say, I'm not going to do that. Or I went out on a ride and within the first 20 minutes, I knew damn well that this session wasn't, wasn't right for me to do on this given day and be brave to make the call to turn home, go home and just go, okay, that's not going to happen today. I'll try again tomorrow or try again the third day. I'm blown away with everything that you're saying there because there's so there's so much in it, you know, in terms of your learning and your journey and the bits you've picked up. And you've shared some aspects around your the, the physical knowledge that you've picked up about the capacity of your body. Um, I'm wondering what what you learned in terms of your psychological, your mental side, because you know that's some journey you've been through. And I'm wondering what what drove you sort of psychologically to push forward and keep going. Uh, I, I think I probably had all the elements of it. But if anything, it really grew me uh, in terms of being able to deal with, you know, every sport person goes through an emotional journey in their career. And there's uh, typically there's more lows than highs, let's face it. So it's about how you actually bounce back from it. You became more resilient. You you dealt with it, dealt with things that didn't go your way rationally. And it, it's hard, It's easier said than done. But some of those experiences in those six years um, have definitely, definitely car you know helped me for the next part of my career um take take forward and i think we all know that road racing and it's not to compare other sports road racing is brutal it is absolutely brutal in terms of psychologically you know i spent 99 percent of my time knackered a because of the amount of training we used to do b uh the the racing is again pretty pretty hardcore um and and i think you just start to realize you know, your, rate, your, your physiology, again, suited certain courses and certain races, but they also taught you how to work with a wider team um, and the communication piece because you couldn't necessarily all talk to each other. You had six in a team, typically. Yeah. Uh, and it taught me a big thing around, how, 
teamwork as well, but also being realistic to you, with yourself and your teammates when you weren't on it or you were on it. Because um, there was often a strategy before you started the race as to who was the protected rider or protected riders or vice versa, who you were riding for. Um, so whilst I digress a little bit in my that answer, um, it, it just taught you a whole range of things that essentially I brought forward into, you know, future career. But psychologically, I think it really did. Uh, I, I'm always about can rather than can't. Okay. Uh, that's a big, big, um, yeah. Motto nearly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is my, my motto. Mantra. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And when things got tough or... Uh, you were on a certain climb and you were in that lead group and there was four people there and you know again my physiology I often I was very good up to about 10k but over 10k it was the uh, 50 kilo diesel engines that would start coming <laughs> <up there. laughs> uh, and it's about showing no emotion um, you know pay, playing poker it's like a game of poker in road right. racing um and and not giving away how much you're hurting if i'm being brutally honest with you or yeah. controlling your breathing um but also using your knowledge about what's coming up and also being able to you know i suppose squeeze the pressure on others at certain points when they don't expect it and also you you think i can't do any more so it's a whole mind game actually that you're having to play out on the road in certain situations I'm loving what you're saying here because for me, there's the, the story is even, you know, if you, you could take the cycling out of it and there's, there's so many key principles in terms of all the environments you've worked in or any job in some ways, you know, in terms of, the, you know, looking at what's up ahead, the mind games of it, l- managing your emotions, you know, dealing with your team and the, the various aspects around that. There's just so many key principles you've kind of picked up there and transferred. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yep. And I, it, I suppose at the time you don't recognise that actually this is what you're learning. And it's any time through the years since and reflection and also going through some challenging times or some really good times that you actually, A, draw on those experiences, but then you also start naming what you actually yeah. start to learn. And that's probably why I wanted to kind of, you know, particularly the police bit, it, it, it's, it's, only, it's taken me till recently to recognise how much I learned in that environment. Yeah. and. Well, and, that, and that was going to be my next thought and question, actually. Whilst you were in it, did you realise the learning you were picking up and what was going on? Or is this um, kind of retrospective in terms of your reflections back on your experience? A bit of both. Uh, a bit of both. I think, you know, when you're faced with live situations that are happening out right in front of you, dealing with, I don't know, uh, you know, domestic abuse yeah. or... Uh, a riot a football a football riot mm-hmm. you know these are live situations that you literally have to deal with there and then um and one thing i know it's a bit of a motto you know you've got two of these one of these um you start you, you really do learn that how how you have to listen very carefully and you can't go full guns in in a lot of these situations and it's about working with people that you not you don't know they're going through different uh, emotions themselves but it's it's about uh, i suppose reading body language listening for listening for cues um but also being able to make decisions under pressure at certain points and taking control of certain situations and in some ways leading but also in some situations stepping back from certain certain situations that might be potentially life-threatening to you as a person so going back to your question i think you, you did realize that you had to oh, well, learn very quickly on the job there were certain aspects that you were being you had to become quite burst in um but I, again i think it's through years and reflection that you start to understand how powerful or how impactful some of those situations have molded you as a person amazing and taking that forward then can you um can you give us a sense of your greatest experience your high that what's been the highlight of that part of your career uh i i think being selected for olympic games within 18 months of taking up road races um genuinely uh it was it was you know, uh, something I, I dreamed of, um, but I never dreamed it would happen so fast. Um, and I would find myself in a team of three, you know, lining up at the Olympic road race, uh, of which, you know, I kind of 
came in in the top 10. I ended up in the sixth position. Again, I kind of reflect and not wanting to go down the negative aspect, but again, I was still missing, I suppose, a, a library of experience that possibly could have, if I had that, I could have probably, you know, I possibly maybe could have, would have. Uh, Who knows been, what? <laughs> yeah, would have been up into that podium sector, but I still see it as a great, great achievement, um, something I'm incredibly proud of. Um, and leading up to that, uh, you know, I, at World Cup level, the World Cups has just started to come into women's racing. I was the first woman to podium at World Cup level in this country. And again, I think it broke the mold and broke the ceiling for others to believe that it's possible because GB at that time, in a cycling perspective, did not have that credibility it has now in terms of being able to get on the podium and win medals. And I hope that through me actually achieving that, it, it uh, inspired other girls, other women who have cycled since that it is possible. So really pushing boundaries there, weren't you, at that stage, you know, and what's really intrigued me so far about your story as well is, you know, coming in through what might be deemed as not the sort of traditional route um, through the traditional pathway and also being, you know, 28 or so, you know, you're you're further down the line in terms of your career. And, you know, I, I love it in terms of identifying that there are so many different ways to progress through a talent pathway here, you know, and I think you've illustrated that for me in terms of, you know, how you've navigated it. Were you conscious of that at the time or how how's that played out for you? I think obviously as I've worked more in the sports system, yes, uh, I probably acknowledged it, if I'm honest with you. I think there are certain sports that um, offer those opportunities and obviously there are certain sports that don't, you know, like the likes of diving, gymnastics. We know that is a, you know, a sport you have to be doing since the age of yeah. three four. four. Um, but I think, you know, uh, I, I, again, I think, it's really, really helped me remain open-minded, particularly when you're kind of looking in or you're working in sports and not writing off people too early because uh, you just don't know. You know, we all know that performance and talent um, development is not linear and everyone will go through different ages and stages of development, but also... Uh, yeah you just don't know what is going on in other people's lives basically sometimes and you have to take that into consideration but I I also appreciate now in the roles that I have done in the last 10 years at some points you do have to make quite hard decisions um, around people's selection going forward but in the next breath you have I I have tried to remain agile and quite open-minded so you mentioned there that the roles you've done in the last 10 years so you you obviously transitioned out of the the sort of the performance environment in terms of a, an athlete into a into a different environment can you tell us a little bit more about those roles that you've played yeah i mean um again i was always intrigued with the business world and that's um that's where i went next after cycling uh it, it's um Again, it was an opportunity uh, that I grabbed with both hands. Um, it wasn't something I went looking for, but it was through, uh, one thing I've learned is about an, having a strong network of people. And it was through someone I knew that offered me the opportunity to go into the world of commerce. Uh, and I worked with um, Zurich Global Insurance and I worked with FTSE 100, 250 companies. <laughs> I didn't know anything about insurance, by the way. Uh, <laughs> why, 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 why did they come and, uh, and give you the opportunity, do you think? What was it about you? Fortunately, he, he competed um, in the sport of Bob Skeleton for Great Britain. So there was a <laughs> affinity and a connection there. Yeah. Um, and also he worked in that particular business at the time, quite high up. Um, and also he, it, it was a passion of his uh, of trying to help support and mentor people that he believed could really add value to the business but also he knew what a sports person ultimately could bring into the business world in terms of some of the behaviors the traits the um skill sets and the personality skill you know personality traits that sports people often have so and in summary what 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 are those for you do you think in summary um resilient um learn fast Agile. Uh, um, I suppose those are the first, those are the, the three mental ones. Great. No, no. And so you you got invited into this environment through an opportunity. So the a door was opened, and you and you just as you said before, you kind of you like the variety. You take your chance, and off you went. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I sold my house and moved down to London. 
<laughs> wow. um, yeah, uh, and entered that world, which was, you know, great. again, I, I really don't regret anything I've ever done. And it taught me loads, um, you know, in terms of what that business world was, but also how I actually uh, looked at budgetary controls, corporate meetings. Um, and I wouldn't say I'm a natural salesperson. <laughs> However, I had to learn fast again how to do that and grow lines of insurance with these FTSE 100 companies. So, um you know, uh, you were measured by that success. So in some ways, I, I, I likened it to your professional supporting environment. You are measured by your success. So it translated into this commercial world. And I, again, uh, I don't know whether it was luck or judgment or whether I was doing an all right job, but I brought in £1.25 million of business within that first 15 months. Um, and for someone that had never really worked in that world, that was deemed pretty successful, which was great. How, how did you do that? You know, how did you bring that element of money in? Or what was it that inspired you? Or, you know, what, what behaviours, uh, traits did you bring to it to achieve those goals? I think first and foremost, it was about relationship building with the people that you were dealing with. Okay. And often uh, they wanted to talk about my background <laughs> and my experiences. Okay. And it was often, you know, um, that kind of opened the conversation to... Okay. Uh, uh, yeah I, I suppose a relationship build and some common interest in often many cases and I'm not saying it was just because of that but often it was about then how did I weave in uh, the business aspect of it and why why Zurich but also why they needed and wanted us to be able to support or underwrite their their streams of insurance for their particular business so it was it was a craft I had to learn um, I didn't necessarily feel I was very comfortable doing it because I, without downplaying, it, it, I don't think it's probably one of my strengths. However, I, it had to become something that I was well versed in. So I think it was a combination of my own background, relationship building, but also being very clear on the messages and also the 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 brand, but also the uh, the value add that that particular company could bring. It's always an interesting dilemma though in my mind about this idea you know and you mentioned it earlier on about you know I'm not really a natural salesperson or I didn't think I was a salesperson and then you're telling me that you you brought in 1.25 million or whatever and I'm thinking how do those two things go together you know because I, and and I, I just I'm really curious I guess in in terms of what sales is you know and what you saw sales and what 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 the attributes again that you brought and you you've mentioned this idea around relationships and actually being that was your key part to to selling here is is actually connecting with people and engaging with them and, and speaking to them and actually by finding out where they were at then you 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 were very successful so I'm, I'm just sort of playing with the idea here that actually many of us think that we're not very good at selling but actually it's maybe it's how we define it or how we see what selling is or the term that's put to it no, I think you're probably right, Dave. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a good way of reframing it, well, actually. I, I, and I'm only saying that because I was in a similar boat. I was in a sales role for a long time, never thought I was any good at it. But actually now I recognize it's about connecting with people. You know, and that's yeah. one of the strengths you've said you've brought all along is how you work within the teams, understanding individuals, being agile and flexible, listening, you know, using your, your ears rather than your mouth. You know, and actually by just doing those really good, solid, basic personable things we deem to be successful yeah uh, yeah yeah no uh, you, good point you summarized it very well <laughs> again I'm, I'm, I'm on a self yeah self-reflection piece here as you kind of refer you know replay that back to me because I do, you know, and I'm, I'm curious again is how, how that relationship bit and the, the strengths that you've built over time um, from the various opportunities you've had have really gone through your career so you you know you were in the sales job within the in the uh, big commercial context where did you go next and how did you take those with you those attributes yeah where did I go next I think uh, I kept on looking over the fence back into the sports world if I'm brutally honest with you and uh, I, I kind of ventured or I took the op next opportunity that was or I, I found um, and that was to work with you in UK sport as a performance advisor for three years 
a great, again, a great, great learning experience, opportunity, uh, a privilege um, in terms of working across the whole landscape of the Olympic and Paralympic sports um, and working in a great little team, if I'm honest with you, where there was some really, really fun, fun people to work with, but also some people with quite diverse backgrounds that I really learned from as well. Um, so it was, what it, you know, the, the essence of the job and there was a, there was a big, big, um, tranche of money that came into the sports system at the time uh, leading up to 2012 it was about or having a portfolio of sports and working with the CEO or the performance director of those respective more mature sports and then on the next on the next level there was a lot of startup companies for want of a better word the likes of fencing wrestling volleyball handball that uh, you, you were you know that then some of those sports were mine you were literally having to roll your sleeves up help write their performance strategies, um, recruit their first head coaches, find a location to actually host athletes, help them identify athletes and almost get the basics in place for them to prepare and hopefully um, qualify, well not qualify, yeah, qualify for the 2012 Olympics. So again, the, the whole experience, it was working with a whole raft of different people and programs from startups to far more mature sports like the likes of sailing, etc., that have been in existence with lottery funding since 1997. Wow, what an amazing opportunity! It sounds uh, uh, leading into a into a kind of a, a home Olympics as well. Yeah, so I, I didn't st I didn't stay around in that role for the home okay. Olympics. Okay. Um, <laughs> after three years, I I kind of then started thinking about what's what's next. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was kind of getting a bit itchy in terms of I actually would like to go and work in a sport and almost again I'm, I'm more of a doer if i'm honest with you i roll up my sleeves and actually uh, create lead um and really have a sort of like hands-on approach in, in a sport um and i knew there was probably one opportunity left before 2012 in the, in the role of a performance director and that was at archery so that was um with, with overseeing the olympic and paralympic programs plus the, the non-olympic disciplines as well i knew nothing about archery um so that's that's where my my next step uh, in my journey or career took me was to archery gb um and i spent a, again a really really uh, exciting five and a half years there uh, and, and learned loads if I'm being brutally really honest with you and this is where I suppose I took some of my learnings from archery and then transferred into the netball world because both both programs if I'm being brutally really honest with you need an overhaul not only from a strategic sense but from a budgetary sense and also identifying the right people in the right roles and making sure we have the right athletes with the right coaches and that's what I always that's a bit of my mantra if I'm honest with you uh, that you know get the basics right um, and in both roles particularly it, it, uh, it took an inordinate amount of effort um, not only by myself but the team that we put in place to to do that. So, so that leads you into um, into the role you're in now, which is just tell us a little bit more. So you're you're in netball, and your role is performance director of England netball. Okay. So, and what does that mean for those people listening? <laughs> <laughs> uh, gosh, every day is different. Um, <laughs> no, I, I oversee the performance uh, and pathway programs within the sport, and that starts from the age of thirteen all the way up to the senior roses team. Um, I also sit on the exec um, of the wider business of England Netball um, and I also sit on the Super League uh, board and that's the domestic league that runs in this country. So it, it's, it's quite far reaching and far, you know, far, yeah, far reaching is how I describe it. But I've also had the privilege of being involved, particularly on the exec side, about the running of the wider business, but also the commercial side of the sport, which is a big, big um, it was a big reason why I took this role, if I'm being brutally honest with you, because the, the CEO at the time, that was her background. She was the, she was the old commercial director of England Netball, worked in that world for many years. And I, I, I started to identify that probably the role of performance director was going to start to change over the years. And it wasn't just going to be simply around performance and talent development. You were going to need a, a bigger skill set. Uh, about how you ran businesses but also the commercial side and 
uh, how sport was changing. It was becoming more about sport entertainment. Uh, and you can sort of see that in, in an array of different sports. And so how, how was your kind of motto of, you know, you mentioned earlier on about, you know, the, the kind of can do attitude. Can you give us an example of how that's played out in your current role where you've really kind of come up against a bit of a, a challenge or a brick wall or whatever, and you've used that kind of motto or attitude mantra to, to help you through? Yeah, so probably one thing I've had, had to learn uh, is to be more patient <laughs> <laughs> um, and also see a more longer term game than a you know, short term um, and also be more skilled in probably how I get that end point. Um, and it kind of goes back to what I've said earlier, you know, the path is never linear but actually translating that into a, in a work environment as well. Because, um, yeah, I, I've, I've just had to become more patient in, <laughs> in many ways as to how we might get there, but also remain open-minded as well as to maybe how what those steps look like. Because um, sometimes we all know that we we get to a certain point and we know that actually going forward might not be the best in the best interest for whatever reason, we might need to kind of go backwards or in some ways take a side step to kind of move forward. So yeah, I think it's uh, I'm not explaining this very well, but just being, yeah, remain, remain focused, remain can do remain agile, but also creative and how you might take those next future steps. And, 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 and I got, just looking forward, you know, you've, you've given a real sense of the role being, as you say, broadened out into being kind of all encompassing, you know, you're, you're running very, very many aspects of the business or being involved in. And I'm wondering, you know, looking forward, we're, we're in a quite a, a challenging economic environment at the moment. What, what do you see some of the challenges down the line being for, for, for either netboard or for sport in general? Yeah, oh, I, I, you know, um, I think we, we already can already start to see what it's looking like. You know, the obvious one is finances. Right. Uh, there's no two ways about it. I think um, women, I'm talking about women's sport, we had great momentum, real great momentum. And, you know, particularly in the netball world as well. It's about how do we, how do we... Um, keep that and, and, and almost like restart, reignite it and restart yeah. it. Um, but also bring people with us, but also commercial partners as well, because, you know, you know, it's not just the sports world, but it's across the whole industry, you know, set of different industries. I think, you know, everyone's going to have to pull the, t- the belt in a bit tighter. So if anything, it's going to challenge everyone to be smarter in how we might approach things and also, you know, creative as to how we go about doing things. So those are probably the, the immediate ones. Um, and I hate it when I kind of come back to it, it's the finances, but it, it, in some ways that's, you know, that's what drives a certain, certain aspect of what you need to do and put in place. But it's a lot around, I think I go back to partnership building and also uh, partnerships across the sport as well. And not only just, you know, other nations. So a big part of what I've been doing in the last <laughs> eight, 10 weeks is actually working far closer with the likes of Australia and New Zealand um, in terms of some of what they're going through, some of what they're coming through, but also some of their lessons, but likewise, you know, what we're going through as well. So it, it's about, yeah, it goes back to building greater relationships and using others. Which is great in terms of the threads from everything you've spoken about, you know, and I've, and I've kind of logged down here in my mind things around the, the power of relationships in all of the roles that you've worked through, the power of team building in all of the relationships that you've had. You know, again, the power of what you said earlier on about um, the importance of having a, a broad and a wide network is being really key to this. And, you know, and I'm smiling in a sense of actually, I wonder if, if you're not just the right person for this particular challenge, because you've, you've, you've faced many challenges along your journey journey and you've always taken the small opportunities and the doors that have opened and gone through them you know and, and I appreciate this is a, a particularly difficult time but I guess we're, we're needing people now with that can-do attitude who are up for taking um, the op- opportunities that present themselves and doing a lot with little uh, and what I mean by that is you know you've, you've come into two small sports that needed an overhaul and actually yeah. needed to be moved on you know yeah. actually maybe even even really um uh, sort of grounded and sports that are in a good position now will probably need a, an overhaul of sorts given the landscape we're going into so maybe you're really well prepared for this 
thanks. <laughs> no, and you, you have picked up on a point that I have actually identified, you know, through both opportunities. I've had to work with, you know, quite small budgets, if I'm yeah. being brutally honest with you, compared to a lot of other sports, bigger sports. And that has taught me really about to make every pound sweat and also mm. be really focused about where we put um, investment and why uh, and the purpose of it behind it. So, no, I, 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 I agree with you. What also fascinates me about your journey is the, the, the diversity of your experiences, yet they're all kind of still feeding in this very day, you know, in terms of budgets are quite key at the moment. But actually, you've, you've had an experience in other domains around finances and budgeting, you know, relationships, but you've had experiences. So you're always calling through from your past experiences and utilizing them. And I don't know if you're aware, but actually one of the, the terms that you've used lots, which I just think is fantastic, is I've, I learned a load there, you know, and you've, you, you've learned such a lot in every experience along the way. And for me, anybody that's listening and um, can only be kind of inspired and encouraged by the fact that just grab everything you've got and learn as much as you can from it, because there's always something that you can call back on. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, I know. And uh, I, think, I think, again, I love learning and I, I think I will always, you know, want to learn more or I, I really enjoy meeting different people from different backgrounds and learning about their their journeys as well. And in some ways I've had to push myself, you know, uh, into out of my comfort zone on occasion where I've identified maybe I'm not particularly skilled at X, Y or Z, but likewise, you know, just picking up little gems from different people. So, you know, again, looking at opportunities, I'm, you know, I, I sit on the performance director strategic group uh, in this country with some really, really, you know, uh, experienced people and performance directors. That's been amazing CPD for me to be able to pick their brain. <laughs> and them, and them. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, totally, totally. Um, you know, and likewise, I, I've picked up two non-exec director roles for Skateboard GB as a sport that's starting out on its journey um, and the British Boxing Board, um, which, you know, been in existence, a very successful program for many years. And it's not only about, I, I, this is one thing I've really become more and more passionate about is actually I want to share some of my experiences, but also I want to help others. In, in this industry, um, either through some of my experiences or some of my mistakes or some of my successes, but ultimately I really enjoy giving back to people that are on their their, their respective career journeys. Well, Sarah, that, that's why we're here today talking, sharing your journey to help others. So I think you, you're, you're living your aspiration to share just, just by sharing the story today. So, you know, thank you for that again. But before we go on just to the last bit where I want to fire a few quick questions at you, I just want to take you back at full circle here. And again, you mentioned there about your, your thirst for learning and, you, you know, you love learning. And I'm just thinking again for those listening in, either embarking on a journey in sport or, or even throughout their career is how and where does that thirst for learning come from? You know, can you, can you create it, develop it? Where, where did your thirst for learning come from? Oh, gosh. I haven't mm. thought about that. <laughs> um, I don't know. I really am struggling to answer that. Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, I just think I've always been quite curious. Um, right. and, you know, kind of, I, I always want to know. I always, I always want to know more and why. Okay. Um, Asking that question, why a lot? Is that something that's kind of been driven into you to to therefore dig deeper? I think it's a female thing. If I'm being brutally honest with you, <laughs> and I can say that as a female, because yeah. in, 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 joking aside, um, you, you thought that when I came into netball that I, I would I would bear that in mind. That has really, really, really taught me something in terms of, you know, working with a predominantly, well, it is all female athlete, uh, you know, pool. And I have really had to think hard about why and how I present certain information to get buy-in. Um, so whilst I think I've always asked it as an individual, it's been even more drilled into me <laughs> as to how you collate information but also present the whys to to a set of athletes but also staff as well and I you know I genuinely believe that and it is it's, this is a very generic statement but I think the female population do ask a lot more whys yeah. and maybe that's part of it I don't know yeah and and therefore to be successful and credible you've always felt that you needed to have that backing and that information to be able to to hold your own yeah, I've gone done loads of uh, personality, uh, you know, tests, etc. And I, I do know um, 
through again through age that I, you know I've got to know myself better that I am very much a, a factual person I draw on evidence I draw on facts I don't draw on hearsay or uh, fluff is how I describe it I, I like to know my subject matter and I like to have underpinning principles um, around things that we are going to do or discuss so again yeah I think that's probably a little bit of an insight as to who I am but also part of my 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 traits yeah and your thirst for learning if i need to keep finding stuff out and understanding so yes. i can so i feel quite solid in what i say and what i do yeah, yes so yeah oh, amazing stuff and again and i hope that just gives an insight into you but also asks others that kind of question about you know what what drives them you know what what are their desires what is their kind of um fallback position in terms of who they are how they work what's important to them to be able to motivate others and also to be kind of um credible in whatever environment that they're in yeah yeah okay so um just before we sort of draw the the uh, the conversation to a close what what i tend to do is is to really want to give the listeners um some real nuggets to take away so i'm going to fire a number of questions at you um okay. and if i can get you kind of quick short sharp answers as best we can but hopefully this will give some other people a bit of an insight both into yourself, but also give them some takeaways. My first question to you, which we've not touched on at all, actually, is books and where you've drawn some of your information from. But I'm just wondering what the three or four books have really informed or currently um, would be on the top of your reading list. Oh, wow. Uh, well, I'll tell you the recent ones I've read or yeah. ones that have kind of stuck in my mind. Brilliant. Um, so I, I'm in, I've been doing some mentoring work and I'm about to embark on an exec coaching um, PG certificate. So, oh, lovely. <laughs> yes. Um, Time to Think by Nancy Klein is one. So I've been re I'm currently reading that. Um, Seven Heavens about the Fijian uh, Sevens team. Uh, I love that book in terms of the whole cultural piece, but how Ben actually went and worked with that, that, that particular team and brought them on so far. I, I really, really found that fascinating journey. A Surgeon's Notes on Performance. I, again, I like to look at different uh, fields that really, really, uh, you, you can't make mistakes, basically. There's, there's world-class expertise there. And, that is you know, life and death, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, totally. They've got to get it right. Um, so that, that was, that's one read that I found quite fascinating. And then probably the last one is um, Redemption by John McGoy. He, you know, he was the guy that was in prison for quite a few years and he's come uh, and he's sort of almost turned his life around and really got into the sport of triathlon, but used the power of sport to inspire others and particularly kids. And I think it's been, it's a, it's a fast, I still, I follow him on Twitter and Instagram and I think it's fascinating. Brilliant. Wow. Eclectic, but, but with a common theme again, it's really deepening your understanding, your thinking. And, and also what I really love is the kind of the, the cross pollination from other domains you know looking at a surgeon but also looking at somebody from different sports for instance or from different domains of psychology even you know so i think it's it is eclectic but i think that's great <laughs> moving on what, what piece of technology or software would you be as a would be your go-to oh gosh well listen i've had to learn my way around teams zoom everything possible so listen i've embraced it um there's definitely uh, there's definitely power in everything that we're doing now uh i, I don't like to, my life to be driven by technology is probably how i'd phrase it okay. how yeah. i understand the importance and also the how it can help you so there isn't one particular app if, I, if i'm honest with you yeah. um, I like to have everything on my phone in terms of my bank accounts, my private email address. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, the weather, you know, it's, it's just having everything at your fingertips. But I wouldn't say there's one particular. Okay, no, good. I like that. Uh, conscious again, right back from your, the start of your story about all of the, um, the performance environments that you've been involved in and actually you watching yourself and how you perform to be your best. How now do you physically and mentally prepare yourself so you can be the best version of you? prepare <laughs> and I've learned the hard way um and I say prepare over prepare in some cases and really really make sure you sit down and uh yeah prepare you before you go into something that you prep you know you do need to prepare for I'll, I'll be I'll, 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 I'll give you a little reason why an insight yeah. I failed my a-levels right so that was one of my probably biggest lessons in life I did not prepare so how can I expect to have passed right wow 
what a great learning right back then, which you've taken through or it's informed your journey. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. So, it. yeah, it was pretty powerful and still remains pretty powerful in my in my world um, and what I do. Um, also, I think uh, I've learned um, a bit of self-talk. If I'm honest with you, there are certain yeah. things that I go back to and certain keywords. Um, which, and also, are, which are? I can. I will. Uh, I do. Um, you know, it goes back to my cycling days when things got tough. You know, it, it was it was about the positives, basically, and reassuring, reassurance aspects of it. Wow. Great. Uh, S- simple, but yet so powerful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm simple. I, I like a lot of basics. <laughs> There's usually the, the three things that I kind of draw on when I, you know, whenever I think about things that I need to kind of come back to. And then the last one um, is, is probably breathing technique. If I'm nervous, I really try to ground myself um, and come back to being present and control of my breathing. And that comes from my cycling days as well. Great. Some magic tips there, Sarah. Thank you. If you were to win the lottery and you won a substantial amount of money, how would you spend it? Oh, I'd love that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'd pay off my usual boring things. I'd pay off the mortgage. Um, I would donate uh, um, some money to certain charities I'm particularly passionate about. Um, uh, I, I I would cycle the world. Um, and go traveling. Um, but I would also want to continue working in some guys. I, I don't think I could not not work. And I don't know, and it wouldn't be full time, don't get me wrong. But I, I again, I, I enjoy working. I enjoy um, what you do. <laughs> yeah. Great. I like that. Um, what advice would you give to your teenage version of yourself? Mm. Given your story and your career? I don't think it's anything that I didn't do, but I didn't necessarily know that I was doing it back then. Um, keep up your education because a sporting career is, is pretty short. Have, those, have that education you know, to fall back on and also get as much work experience as possible and it doesn't necessarily have to be paid for. Nice. I like those. Um, and again, what, what's really blown me away is the, um, you know, the various environments that you've worked in and the opportunities that you've taken. Uh, and I know this might be quite a tricky question, but who are the three most impactful people you could identify or who come to mind throughout your career? It's really hard to narrow down to three because there's been lots of people. Uh, I think probably um, a, a PE teacher in my secondary yeah. school, particularly, who really, really encouraged and supported my, my, yeah, my exploration of all these different sports. There was a guy called Mick Thornywell who I was in the police with. He was a sergeant or inspector, actually, um, who I I cycled with loads. And he taught me loads about riding my bike. And that was before I fell into the whole world of cycling. And interestingly, he went on uh, and his wife, actually, was the first woman to walk to the South Pole. So they had an adventure through their blood, basically. So that's probably why I got on so well with them. Um, So, yeah, him. Um, And also, yeah, basically, I spent miles staring at his back wheel groveling um but also <laughs> he was quite an inspirational guy in terms of just teaching me and uh, sharing with me some of his experiences on a bike and then lastly I think I've already alluded to him a guy called John Herity who was my first team manager in in my cycling days along with Peter Keane who set up the British cycling program uh who was the performance director and he did coach me for a certain uh, point in my career great and again really inspirational people but at different stages in your life which is it's lovely to sort of call back on and never forget those that actually set you on your way which is really yeah. really key Sarah you know you you've shared your story for me it's been amazing hearing it the highs and the lows but also some of the key principles that have driven you through your journey I'm just wondering whose sports story would you be really keen to hear can I have two? Oh, go on then <laughs> <laughs> And uh, for different reasons, Serena Williams, I mean, you know, for me, to someone to stay at the top of her sport for so long is incredible. And I know there's been lots of books and documentaries, but I would love to spend a day or a few hours just yeah. kind of uh, talking through what that looks like um, and what it really was. You know, A, as an Afro-Caribbean woman, yeah. but also the longevity of her career and how she's managed to keep herself uh, and her body together for that yeah. long 
and that competitiveness and drive. Uh, fascinating. And then more controversially, Lance Armstrong. <laughs> Um, you know outside of the obvious and I know that uh, again I think I've noticed that he's going to tell us the truth this time in in the the last two weeks he's promised another sequel to his 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 past um, confession Uh, again I I would just love to understand I would really really like and be fascinated to spend a few hours with him uh, and understand his career but also him more as a person uh, and it's not about the drugs but it's about you know he was still very very talented talent he was incredibly talented but I would also like to understand uh, yeah a bit more about the why. Wow P- two, two um, very interesting people for, for different reasons but actually both at the top of their game or you know being being in the, in the spotlight which I think is incredible um, and it would be lovely to hear their stories further so there's a there's a goal for me there or for us to try and see if we can get them um, to have a podcast with us but so you know I could talk to you all day and I, I would love to spend more time sort of digging deeper and hearing more because I'm sure you've only skimmed the surface of some of the stories and the uh, the experiences you've had but I, I just wanted to draw us to an end and say you know it's been a real pleasure for me hearing your story I did know parts of it but I've learned so much more about you today but I've also taken a number of tips away and, and, and that sort of desire for learning and to taking opportunities and having that sort of positive I can I will attitude has driven through both our conversation today but also I can see it, how it's really helped you in your career both in sports in business and then back into sport in a kind of a more administrative managerial role so Thank you ever so much for sharing that with us. And I'd just like to say, you know, if, if any of the listeners would like to hear a little bit more from you or find out what you're doing at Netball, how might they follow you or, or make contact with you? Um, well, I wouldn't say I'm the biggest social media use. However, um, I, I am on Twitter and Instagram. So at S Symington, uh, Sarah Symington for Instagram. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn as well. So yeah, again, um, I think that's been a theme through this this conversation we've had. I really enjoy meeting new people. So if people do want to reach out. There we go. Um, what I'll do is I'll make sure that the contact details are on the show notes below the podcast. Um, so thanks for sharing those. Um, really, really good luck in the challenging times ahead. And I know you won't see them as a challenge. You'll see them as a, I can and I will. But good luck with that. Thanks again for your time today. And let's hope come back together again in a year or so's time and see how we're getting on we could have a you know episode two how does that sound (laughs) that's great no more than up for it and thank you very much it's absolute pleasure great stuff well thanks sarah take care and we'll see you soon cool thank you wow so there we have the incredible story of sarah symington what an amazing and interesting journey she's had i particularly like the idea she just played loads of different sports as a young person following her interests and enjoyment. Her career path was then by no means straightforward, linear or traditional. The transferable skills and experience she gained in the police seemed to be really beneficial in all that she did. I left her conviction and bravery to change things when they were not working for her anymore. Recognizing that triathlon was not for her, but seeing the opportunity in the cycling discipline with the result being talent spotted in her late twenties. This was incredible. After many career highs in cycling, and I'm sure there were some lows, she took the opportunity to experience working in business, finance, and the insurance world, once again learning many new skills and gaining many experiences. It was becoming clear that there were themes and key principles evolving from Sarah's story. For me, they were as follows. Her great thirst for learning, she created and took the opportunities that were presented, and lastly, she demonstrated and maintained a positive attitude at all times. So based on my reflections from Sarah's story, I would like to pose the following questions to you. What self-talk do you have that does not help you? And how can you change it so that it becomes more helpful and effective? And lastly, what opportunities are you not taking and why? I do hope the questions prove helpful and leave you to think and that you enjoyed listening to the podcast today. I'd really appreciate you letting your friends, family and colleagues know where you can find the Sports Stories podcast. We are on all the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. It would also be appreciated if you could leave a brief review on Apple to help guide potential listeners to the great content. And lastly, please make contact with me if you have any feedback or comments that would help you get more from the show. So from me, Dave Levine, have a great week, and I look forward to having you with me for the next 
episode of the Sports Stories podcast. 